Well, it's 12 noon, top of the hour, and welcome everyone. I'm uh, Conrad Lyles, uh, Vice Chair of the Department of Medicine, and it's my pleasure today for Medicine Grand Rounds to, um, uh, to introduce our four Chair of Medicine uh, Scholar Award uh, uh, recipients for this year. And the Chair of Medicine Scholars Awards were initiated in 2013, and they're awarded annually to meritorious University of Washington Department of Medicine trainees uh, to aid in their transition from really basically uh, the K to R transition period when they're becoming uh, independent investigators, principal investigators in their own right. And um, each award comes with a talk that they get here for Medicine Grand Rounds, but also with $50,000 times uh, for, for two years uh, to support their uh, research efforts. It can be used for salary support or for other purposes as needed by each recipient. And this year we have uh, four recipients. The four recipients are Amanda Casto, who will talk first, followed by Helen Jack, who talk second, Tessa Steele, who will be our third speaker, and uh, Jason Simmons will be our fourth speaker. And as I'll introduce each of each of the each of the speakers, then they will give their talk, and that'll be followed by introduction of the next speaker and their talk. If you have questions, please put them in the chat, and then uh, uh, and then uh, questions will be um, addressed to each of the speakers at the conclusion of all four talks. So without further ado, I'd like to have inter introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Amanda Casto. Uh, Dr. Casto is an acting assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And I turn it over to Amanda. OK. Um, and hopefully everybody can now see my screen. Um, Please speak now or forever hold your peace if you can't. It is good. It is good. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, Conrad. Um, uh, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, I'm Amanda Casto. I'm from the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, and I'm going to be doing my best to uh, give an introduction both to myself and my research, um, which involves uh, applications of viral genomic data to public health and clinical practice um, in, in 12 minutes. So hopefully I will be successful. Um, so yes, I've always really been fascinated by genomics. Um, and I, I think the foundation of this really is um, thinking about the, the dual nature of the genome, both as a record keeper transmitting information from one generation of an organism to the next, um, and also acting as a record for a species um, and giving us the ability to distinguish from uh, between different uh, members of the same species. Um, and then also as a blueprint, um, which gives an organism instructions on how to build itself. Um, so I started studying genetics pretty early on. Um, as an undergrad at the University of Georgia. Um, I then went on to do an MD-PhD program at Stanford. Um, and at Stanford, I was in Mark Feldman's lab um, where I was studying uh, global human genomic diversity. Um, and I had always planned to continue to do research um, in human genomics, but when I was doing residency in internal medicine at Stanford, I got really interested in infectious diseases. Um, and so ultimately kind of uh, took a little bit of a turn and did fellowship uh, at UW in infectious diseases. Um, and along with that, I changed from doing human uh, genomic research um, to now focusing on viral genomics. And my research at UW, um, which I've been doing since about 2018, 2017, um, has focused sort of on two areas. Um, one is trying to um, discern the uh, impact of viral genomics um, on clinically relevant endpoints. Um, and the other is um, investigating ways to augment epidemiologic and public health studies um, using viral genomic data. Um, and I've been really fortunate to have a number of great mentors um, in this uh, in this endeavor, um, one is Christine Johnston, um, who I've worked with on uh, herpes simplex uh, virus projects. Also, Helen Chu, um, who I've worked with on respiratory viral projects. Um, I've I've also been mentored by Alex Greninger, who's in the Division of Laboratory Medicine, um, and he has helped me out with sequencing um, and also bioinformatics. And then Michael Wu at the Hutch, um, who has um, overseen some of the statistics for some of my projects. 
Um, and today I have worked on a number of different projects that are very diverse, but um, to just to try to give you a taste of what one of these projects look like, uh, I'm gonna be talking about a project that I worked on a few years ago. Um, and the impetus for this project really was that um, the clinical lab um, was considering whether or not to institute um, genotypic testing for antiviral resistance for HSV. Um, and so we wanted to perform an analysis to see how phenotypic and genotypic testing performed head to head um, in a clinical setting. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background um, and things that you need to know to understand this project, um, so one, um, although we don't really think about it on the same level as resistance in HIV, um, there is quite a lot of antiviral resistance in HSV. Um, about 10% of the infections in immunocompromised hosts are due to viruses that have some antiviral resistance. And that number goes up to about um, half, 50% in the bone marrow transplant population. Um, also important to know that um, the herpes virus viruses have really big genomes but all of the known resistance mutations are actually confined to two genes, the thymidine kinase, um, which houses some of the acyclovir resistance mutations um, and the DNA polymerase, which uh, contains acyclovir, sodafovir, and phoscarnet resistance uh, mutations. So even though the genomes of these viruses are really big, um, the, uh, our, our efforts could really focus just in on these, on these two genes where these antiviral resistance mutations are located. I also just want to give you a little bit of background on doing resistance testing for HSV. Um, so in the past, the one and only way to do resistance testing was uh, through phenotypic testing. Um, it requires viral culture. Um, so you have to grow up the cells first, then you have to infect the cells with virus, uh, and generate plaques, um, and then actually apply the antiviral. So the turnaround time for this is very slow. It's become even slower because a lot of uh, clinical labs, especially, are not doing viral culture anymore. Um, and the send-out tests, um, the all, all antivirals or testing is not always available. Um, and the alternative to this, um, which is uh, up and coming, is genotypic testing has a much faster turnaround. Um, the problem though is, is that in these two genes where these antiviral resistance mutations are located, there's a lot of un, uh, unclassified mutants, so mutants of unknown significance. And this characterization at least initially has to be done through phenotypic testing. So if you do genotypic testing, you may um, come across mutations that you don't know exactly what they mean. Um, so to do this project, um, we got a collection of, uh, of HSV samples that were taken from uh, two pediatric patients that had DOC8 deficiency. Um, and this is a congenital immunodeficiency, which causes hyper um, IgE uh, syndrome. And I think this is a really interesting picture because it, it shows the basis of this immunodeficiency. So DOC8 is actually involved in cytoskeleton um, construction and um, these mutations that cause the deficiency um, prohibit the white cells from um, migrating correctly um, within the skin uh, and mucocutaneous tissues. And so instead of moving kind of as a nice unit, they get stretched out um, and, and ultimately are not able to migrate properly. So these patients get very severe um, mucocutaneous infections, including with um, HSV. Um, so we got a total of 13 samples um, uh, of HSV-1 that were collected over a four year period. These were from two individuals, one or 12 of them were actually from our sort of primary subject. Um, and one of the samples was from his brother who also had DOC8 deficiency. Um, eight of these samples had already had phenotypic testing done prior to the beginning of our project. Um, and so we wanted to perform genotypic testing on them to compare it to the results of the phenotypic testing. And we had nine total samples out of the 13 that were available and left over for us to do genotypic testing on. Um, and to go along with this, we also had data about when um, these individuals uh, during the four-year study period were exposed to different antivirals. Um, so here's the results. So here are our samples um, and just showing sort of the chronological order. This is the one sample that we had from um, our main subject's brother down at the bottom. 
Um, and this is the result of the phenotypic testing. Again, this was pre-existing before we had um, we had started our project, um, but uh, it's grouped into R, um, which is resistance, S is sensitive, this is the MIC, and then I, I'll get to a little bit later, but that's indeterminate result. Um, and then on those nine samples I was telling you about, we performed uh, genotypic testing by sequencing the thymidine kinase and DNA polymerase. And this, uh, this analysis um, to us suggested that um, all nine samples were uh, had an acyclovir resistance mutation. So they all actually had the same mutation. And then one sample had uh, sidofovir resistance. Um, and then we also compared that to when um, the individuals were exposed to different antivirals. So, you know, our, our main point of this project was to kind of compare um, how the phenotypic testing and genotypic testing performed. Um, we can see that overall, they kind of tell a similar story. Um, most of the samples were read by phenotypic testing as being a cyclovir resistant, and all of them were read as being a cyclovir resistant by genotypic testing. Um, and most of them for phoscarnet were read as sensitive, um, and we did not see any genotypic evidence of phoscarnet resistance. Um, but there were some differences. Um, so number one, as I um, uh, was mentioning, so this, this individual, the first sample um, was uh, phenotypically read as being phoscarnet resistant. However, this individual, as far as we knew, had not actually been exposed to phoscarnet before at this point. So that result seemed a little odd. Um, I already mentioned the indeterminate results, which is basically a failed test. Um, so this is a, a, a instance where we actually got no information back from this test. Um, and then there was also one instance where um, the uh, the samples were read as being acyclovir sensitive, despite the genotypic testing showing um, that all the samples were, uh, or indicating that all the samples were uh, resistant to acyclovir. And finally, we also had sort of an interesting observation in that all of the uh, all of these samples had the same acyclovir resistance mutation, and that included. Um, both the, the primary subject and his brother. And so that was kind of an interesting observation for reasons that I'll get into. Um, so conclusions from this project, we actually thought that the genotypic testing performed really well compared to phenotypic testing and may have even outperformed phenotypic testing. Um, we base this on the fact that from phenotypic testing, there's a high number of indeterminate results. So um, times when essentially the assay fails and doesn't give you any information. Um, and then it also seemed that the genotypic testing went was much more consistent with um, the story um, and the timeline of antiviral exposure um, in the patient. So we saw, for instance, that um, sidofovir mutation appear right after um, this patient had been exposed to sidofovir, and then subsequently it went away. Um, and so that was very consistent um, with the story that, uh, that we had from the patient's clinical data. Um, and so we have actually instituted this test now, so it's available to be ordered um, if you have a case where you're concerned about um, acyclovir resistance um, in HSV. Um, and uh, you can still order the phenotypic testing um, as a send out, um, but it just takes a very long time to come back and is often really not, um, by the time it comes back, uh, able to be clinically actionable. Um, and the other interesting thing that we figured out, so this was the first evidence that's been found that um, HSV resistance can actually be um, transmitted um, between immunocompromised individuals. Um, and that evidence was essentially that even though there are many, many, many different ways that um, a virus can acquire acyclovir resistance, both the patient and his brother um, had the same acyclovir resistance mutation. So probably one transmitted to the other, or they acquired HSV from the same individual. Um, so just to kind of wrap up here, um, and I know I'm getting kind of close to time, but um, the importance in, in, of, of this, the area that I'm working in is, um, is, has really been increasing because uh, sequence-based um, testing and diagnostics um, have a very quick turnaround time, especially when you're comparing to culture-based um, and also genome sequencing um, can have a very quick turnaround time um, and the cost for this to continue to decrease so that you will see more and more um, genetic-based testing um, come online. 
Um, and part of that is, um, is we're instituting these tests, it's really important for us to understand the underlying pathogen genomic variation um, in order to understand what the tests are telling us and to understand um, when we may see false positives and false negatives. Um, the other thing is with the ability for us to generate more um, genetic data more quickly, um, you will see a lot of um, sequence-based surveillance um, being utilized in public health and epidemiologic studies. Um, and if we're really to get the most out of this information, we need to understand how viral genotype and phenotype are connected. Um, and so these are kind of my two main areas that I'm planning to focus on going forward. Um, and since it's about 12.15, I think I'll kind of switch over, skip over the uh, the next slide um, to kind of reiterate some of this. Um, and I just want to thank the Department of Medicine for giving me a chance to talk um, and, and for this award, um, my mentors and collaborators, um, my division for their support, as well as uh, my funding sources. Um, and I'd be very happy to take um, any questions uh, at the end today. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Amanda. And once again, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat function, which will be monitored by the chief resident. And questions can uh, will be addressed to the appropriate um, speaker at the end of all four presentations. So uh, we'll move on to our next speaker now. As And our next speaker is Dr. Helen Jack. And Dr. Jack is an assistant professor in the Division of uh, General Internal Medicine. And uh, she'll be talking to us today about mutual capacity building approaches to increasing access to behavioral health care in Zimbabwe and Washington State prisons. So I'm turn it over, I'll turn it over now to Dr. Jack. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Um, it's a privilege to be here. So in terms of disclosures, in 2022, I did a very small amount of paid consulting for a public benefits company that works to improve primary care for Medicaid patients. And although I'm still affiliated with them, I've not worked with them in the past year and their work was not related to what I'm presenting today. So I'm a primary care physician and physician scientist in the Division of General Internal Medicine. After completing medical school at Harvard, I came to University of Washington for internal medicine residency, where I was in the primary care track. I finished residency a little more than two years ago and joined the faculty. Since finishing residency, I have done the vast majority of my clinical work in primary care at Coyote Ridge Correction Center, a medium and minimum security men's prison in rural Eastern Washington, about three hours east of Seattle and 45 minutes north of the Tri-Cities. At Coyote Ridge, I work with a team of advanced practice practitioners to care for 1,700 incarcerated people. As the only physician currently seeing patients, I support the advanced practice practitioners by seeing our medically complex patients, those with hep C, cirrhosis, cardiac disease, and an A1C greater than 9%. I'm also involved with the prison system at the state level, helping develop clinical guidelines for these patient populations. So I've led the development of guidelines for diabetes and hypertension management across the state prison system. So these days, I spend a week each month in Connell, Washington, living in the trailer shown here and seeing patients at Coyote Ridge, and the balance of my time is spent in Seattle doing research. So in both my research and clinical work, I'm fundamentally motivated by the question of access to high-quality, evidence-based mental health and addiction care. For many people, particularly those in low-resource settings, primary care is the main point of access that they have for health care, so mental health and addiction services have to be offered within primary care. And particularly in low resource settings, expanding access to behavioral health care is often a question of implementation. It's not that we don't have cost effective, evidence based treatments for mental health conditions and for addiction, but it's that we're not using them. Accordingly, a lot of my um, research focuses on implementation science, the study of how to bridge the gap between what we know and what we do in practice. So, over the next several minutes, I'm gonna tell you about two ongoing NIH funded studies that I'm leading, both of which were funded in the past 14 months. So first I'll speak about my ongoing study on opioid use disorder screening in the state prison system. Then I'll tell you about my K23, which focuses on depression, depression screening and treatment in Zimbabwe. These two projects may seem very different, but I think we also often falsely dichotomize global and domestic work. And I'm interested in thinking about how these two settings can inform each other. To be fair, I could talk about each of these studies for hours, but I'm gonna to try to cover them each in about three or four minutes. So try to bear with me here. 
Um, so first, let's talk about opioid use disorder screening in prisons. One piece of background information that's really important to understand before jumping into our ongoing study is the difference between prison and jail. So many people may already know this, but for those of you who don't, jail is where people go when they're first arrested and they stay there if they're convicted of a crime and serving sentences that are less than a year. So people in jail are often rapidly cycling in and out. Prisons are where people go after they have been convicted of a crime if they are serving a sentence of a year or more. So people don't typically go from the community to prison. They go from the community to jail to prison and are often in prison for a much longer time. So these are very different clinical settings and very different in terms of what it's like to implement interventions within them. And so I work in a prison, one of these longer stay facilities. So at least 15% of people who are in jail or prison have opioid use disorder, which is far higher than the general population. In fact, in one study in Rhode Island, 50% of people who died of opioid overdoses had had some kind of justice system involvement. And risk of death, particularly death from opioid overdose, is very high in the weeks after people release from prison because they've been incarcerated for quite some time and they've lost their opioid tolerance, then they return to use. So there's a growing evidence base that medication for opioid use disorder like methadone and buprenorphine reduces mortality, reduces risk of return to use, and reduces risk of return to incarceration if it's given to people as they're releasing from jail or prison. Yet unfortunately, only 3.6% of people who are incarcerated with opioid use disorder in 2021 received medication for their disease. And really the first step in getting people access to medication is figuring out who has opioid use disorder. But figuring out who has opioid use disorder in a prison is really complicated. When, prison with, with, when people with opioid use disorder present to a community-based primary care clinic, to an emergency department or jail, they're often intoxicated, in withdrawal, or they have a urine drug screen that contains opioids. So clinically, opioid use disorder is not subtle in these settings. In prison, however, people are coming from jail where they have less access to opioids than they have in the community. So they don't often show many of these clinical signs that we would look for in community-based setting. So prisons have to rely on self-report to diagnose opioid use disorder. And however, despite the high prevalence of opioid use disorder in this setting and the many challenges of opioid use disorder diagnosis in prison, there are actually no brief self-report validated screening tools that have been validated in a prison setting to look for opioid use disorder. Which brings me to our current study. So in collaboration with a researcher at Kaiser Permanente of Washington, Leah Hamilton, we got a supplement to a P30 grant that's housed at UW to do formative work around opioid use disorder screening in prisons. So we're going to be interviewing key stakeholders, including incarcerated people, recently released people, and prison healthcare and reentry staff. And the goal of these interviews is to inform a future study to validate the first brief opioid use disorder screening tool in prisons. So essentially, we want to ensure that we're validating a tool that is acceptable to patients and staff and that is feasible to administer. Because if it's not acceptable and feasible, staff won't use it and patients won't report accurately and so it's not worth validating. And so we're just starting this formative work and hope to start interviews in the next few weeks. And then later this year, I plan to submit an R-level grant to, to finally do the actual validation itself. So to bridge the two projects I'm going to talk about today, let me spend a moment discussing mutual capacity building. Often we separate global health and local health into different departments, funding streams, and training programs, even though they often address similar problems. Both in Seattle and Zimbabwe, there is not enough mental health and addiction treatment to meet community needs, particularly the needs of people who are poor or otherwise socially marginalized. Why can't we learn from each other? I think especially as we think about doing more equitable, decolonized global health research that's led by people from low and middle income countries rather than by people from high income countries, I think it's important to see myself as a learner when I'm doing global health work. What can I both contribute to Zimbabwe, but also learn from my own community here in Washington? So now let's talk about depression screening and treatment in Zimbabwe. This is the study that my K23 Career Development Award from the National Institute of Mental Health is currently supporting. So Zimbabwe in Southeastern Africa is one of the poorest countries in the world with an unstable democracy and rampant hyperinflation. For its population of 14 million people, there are 17 psychiatrists. Needless to say, primary care is one of the only places to get medical care for mental health conditions. I've been doing mental health work in Zimbabwe since 2013, prior to starting medical school, primarily in collaboration with King's College London and the University of Zimbabwe. 
Throughout medical school and residency, I fit in travel to Zimbabwe, primarily to teach research methods and academic writing to early career Zimbabwean mental health researchers as part of large capacity building grants, and also to do some of my own research on the mental health system. And now I'm collaborating with many of the Zimbabwean early career researchers to whom I taught writing throughout my training. So in most low-income countries, more than 95% of people with mental health conditions lack access to treatment. But Zimbabwe is trying to change that. There are two ongoing global efforts focused on Zimbabwe to help scale up access to depression care led by the Zimbabwean government. First, a Zimbabwean psychiatrist developed the Friendship Bench, a six-session therapy intervention that can be delivered by lay people. He did a cluster RCT of this intervention, which was published in JAMA in 2016, and it works. The Friendship Bench is now being scaled up nationwide with resources from the government of Canada. And second, Zimbabwe is one of nine countries around the world that are the focus of the WHO's, the World Health Organization's, special initiative for global mental health. The WHO is providing resources to try and primary care providers who are mostly nurses in MHGAP, which is the WHO's mental health treatment guidelines. So MHGAP is a, usually delivered as a one-time five-day training in all of mental health care. And after nurses get this training, they're sent back out to their practice sites to deliver care. So the combination of these two efforts, the Friendship Bench and the Special Initiative, really provide an opportunity to study implementation and to support ongoing Zimbabwean-led efforts around mental health implementation. However, so I was concerned that a one-time five-day training is actually not enough to get busy nurses in primary care to change their practice. Based on some of my prior work, I was particularly worried that nurses would struggle to identify people with depression because screening is not covered in the global guidelines, and without recognition, they would not know who to refer to the friendship bench. So that brings me to the five-year study for which we're also just now starting data collection. So first, we're going to do a cross-sectional study to see what is happening now after the one-time five-day MH gap training. So are nurses and our four randomly selected clinics able to identify people with depression and refer them to the friendship bench? After identifying gaps in the depression care cascade, we'll do a series of qualitative interviews and focus groups with nurses to identify barriers to depression identification and guideline implementation. And I hypothesize that having training in mental health skills is not enough, that we actually need clinic level supports like record keeping systems or practice reminders to support implementation. So finally, we'll conduct a pilot cluster randomized controlled trial of a clinic level strategy. So not skills training, but more clinic level support in two treatment clinics and two control clinics with the goal of assessing whether the strategy is feasible and acceptable in this setting. And my hope is that this work will inform both current implementation, which is ongoing nationwide, but will also lead to a future adequately powered cluster RCT to further test these clinic level strategies. So what's next? I mean, in the near term, I feel like I have a lot to do getting these projects up and running to try to answer these questions. And I'm really looking forward to spending the next few years exploring screening and initial referral to behavioral health services in these two low resource primary care settings. I really could not have done this without my mentors, collaborators, um, both at University of Washington and in, in Zimbabwe. And I'm really grateful that for the support that the Chair of Medicine Scholars Award, Award has provided. So welcome questions at the end of the talk, but also please feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or want to talk more about these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. And uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat function and questions will be addressed to the appropriate speaker at the end of all four talks. And moving on, our third speaker is uh, Dr. Tessa Steele. Uh, Dr. Steele is an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and she'll will, and the title of her uh, uh, talk is Why Alcohol Withdrawal? So Tessa, I turn it over to you. Thanks, a big thank you to the selection committee members for the Chair of Medicine Scholars Award, Dr. Jung, Dr. Lyles, for organizing this grand rounds, the opportunity to speak. The ask for this talk was to share a bit of personal history, career evolution, and current science, which is actually a great combination for me because when I talk about studying alcohol withdrawal as a pulmonary critical care specialist, sometimes I get an eyebrow raise, like, why do you study alcohol withdrawal? And the answer to the question typically involves sharing a bit of both personal history and career evolution. And so on the one hand, there is a timeline in which one phase of life led to the next and led to the next. But on the other hand, there are consistencies or themes that run throughout this timeline. And so I want to start by sharing three things that have been constant motivators for me. And the first is that I love working and playing on teams. 
The second is that I love to argue. And I think my parents, possibly my siblings are in the audience. And so they could attest to this, but here I'm not really referring to an angry verbal contest more. I'm talking about building a case or crafting an argument um, that can be convincing for a new idea or change. And third, social justice. From a young age, I was sort of obsessed with the notion of fairness and asking what is fair, what is not fair, why do certain people have certain experiences and others don't? And so you'll hear these themes and see these icons throughout the talk. My personal history, in brief, I had a very lucky childhood. I grew up playing in the woods of Sammamish, Washington, and this was at the time unincorporated King County. And it's important to me to acknowledge this area as traditional hunting grounds for the Snoqualmie tribe. Sammamish is actually a Snoqualmie word or kind of the corruption and combination of two Snoqualmie words, one for people of a certain area and to their word for Lake Sammamish. And so this photograph of tribal members was taken very close to where I grew up almost a century before I arrived. And so I acknowledge the Snoqualmie as the original caretakers of the land where I grew up, which is still beautifully forested with dug fir, cedar trees, lots of wildlife. I grew up playing lots of team sports, especially soccer, which really fostered my love for working on teams. But on weekends when I wasn't on the soccer field, I could be found at Lincoln Douglas debate tournaments. And Lincoln Douglas, or LD debate, is a type of 1v1 competition that's often called a values debate because con contestants have to come prepared to argue either side of a contentious resolution using ethical principles, usually grounded in philosophy or critical theory or other schools of thought. And so when I went to college at Dartmouth, I had the full intention of majoring in government and going to law school. But in the course of that really excellent liberal arts education, I fell in love with science and really science as um, an idea that science is this collective, cumulative, kind of ever expanding source of human achievement that could be used as a mechanism for social justice. And I came to see scientific research as a really powerful form of argument that could not only convince people to see things your way, but could convince them of real phenomena or truth that would perhaps have more significant lasting positive impact on our social world. And I think uh, a small but relevant aside, I took this phenomenal course on alcohol and, so and society in college and sort of true to the depiction of Animal House um, and Dartmouth's Greek system here, the Greek system encouraged historically very heavy alcohol use. And the course was developed and run by an amazing group of alumni who were scholars and who also self-identified as alcoholics. And it explored the complexities of alcohol's role in society in our rituals, our culture, our religion, and in causing disease. And I was introduced to the work of another Dartmouth alum named Robert Holbrook Smith, or Dr. Bob. And Dr. Bob is the physician and surgeon who co-founded Alcoholics Anonymous with Bill Wilson. And so when I look at back at this all these years later, these layers really hold um, a lot of significance for me. Moving forward in time, I did write about science as a lever for social justice in my medical school application, and I ultimately completed the MD and PH program at OHSU with the expressed purpose of becoming a physician scientist. And it was during this training, and especially during my internal medicine residency at Mass General, that I was increasingly impressed and at times really shocked by inequities in our application of science to the practice of medicine. And this really came about through personal experiences. So just the juxtaposition of treating patients in the huge fancy private rooms of the oncology wards using highly specific immunotherapies for cancer supported by incredible amounts of science and then trying to manage a problem I encountered almost daily on the general medicine wards and that was alcohol withdrawal syndrome really trying to apply evidence-based practices, but finding that no high quality evidence actually existed to support certain treatments over others for patients struggling with alcohol use disorder in hospitals. And so I came to the University of Washington to specialize in pulmonary and critical care because I wanted to work with patients who are experiencing the most severe manifestations of alcohol and other substance use disorders. And this graph showing prevalence of SUDs across healthcare um, delivery really reflects my experience in training where, for example, I had one to two patients in my primary care panel as a resident with alcohol use disorder, but I cared for a lot of alcohol use during my ED rotations and on the wards and felt pretty much bombarded by the illness sequelae of alcohol and substance use disorders in the intensive care unit. And this is really due to associations between alcohol, especially, and many conditions requiring critical care and well, I think these connections are often obvious in clinical practice, understanding the full scope of critical illnesses in patients with alcohol use disorder based on published literature 
really requires digging and synthesis. And when we query the literature regarding these connections that I'm just zooming in on two categories of organ injury and infection, we can piece together a large number of associations, but from studies um, really focused on cohorts of patients with decompensated cirrhosis, delirium, hepatitis, pneumonia, sepsis being the primary focus of study. These are just graphs of um, study counts publishing associations with alcohol use. But we never see, for example, a prospective cohort of hospitalized patients with alcohol use disorder as the primary inclusion criteria, really following them forward and characterizing their illnesses and experiences. But we should focus on alcohol use disorder in hospitals and in the ICU because critical illness, especially requiring ICU admission, can be a pivotal event for patients with AUD, both as a motivator to change use behaviors and as an opportunity to connect with addiction resources in the hospital. But for us to use the hospitalization as a reachable moment and intervene on patients' underlying use disorder, which is often the root cause of why they're in the hospital, we really have to improve how we treat alcohol withdrawal syndrome or AWS. Because the delirium caused by AWS and or the iatrogenic delirium caused by the medications we use to treat AWS prevents patients from meaningfully engaging in treatment planning for their use disorder in the hospital. And benzodiazepines have been the historical mainstay of treatment for AWS, but these agents are now known to have dose-dependent relationships with delirium, short and long-term cognitive impairment, and mortality. And these risks are exaggerated in patients with brain vulnerability, that is in the elderly, um, patients with acute neurologic injury or severe sepsis. And we would expect patients with alcohol use disorder, which is fundamentally a brain disease, However, the comparative safety of benzodiazepines versus other potential first-line therapies for alcohol withdrawal has never been the subject of rigorous investigation. There's never been a generalizable randomized control trial of sick hospitalized patients testing different treatments for alcohol withdrawal. The withdrawal literature you may be familiar with comes from specialized detoxification units, small studies excluding patients who are acutely ill and not in hospital settings. So in the absence of strong evidence supporting benzodiazepines for AWS and increasing evidence of harm due to benzos in hospitals, providers have understandably been searching for other treatments and especially using phenobarbital now recommended by the American Society of Addiction Medicine as a first line alternative to benzodiazepines, but still in the absence of high quality evidence for or against. And overall in this relatively data free context, real world treatment practices in hospitals for alcohol withdrawal are all over the map. And so my K23 research builds toward a pragmatic trial that will compare the effectiveness and safety of different real world treatment strategies for AWS. And this is very much a team sport. My team of mentors and collaborators includes Kathy Bradley, who has been my incredible primary mentor for the past seven years. Nick Johnson, um, who has also been an amazing mentor and advocate for me since I arrived at UW. Kevin Holgren is one of the most thoughtful mentors and investigators I know. Many residents I've worked with clinically are now part of my research team, which is exciting. Nina Kim and her fabulous um, analyst, Ayushi Gupta, helped me build a cohort of 1,400 patients with AWS hospitalized across our UW um, hospital system. And many other individuals have been part of this journey for me. I want to share a brief snapshot of the work we're currently doing to understand treatment variation um, for AWS in our hospitals. We first conducted 140 detailed chart reviews to understand in depth what are the common real world treatment patterns or sequences of medications patients are receiving. We're also looking at treatment outcomes, mainly in our larger EHR cohort and investigating what is reliably documented in the electronic health record as part of regular clinical care and therefore possibly a suitable outcome to use in a pragmatic trial. And there's no rigorous literature to guide us in this, but one outcome we think may do a reasonable job separating better versus worse treatment experiences is the need for physical restraints in the hospital. This is more reliably documented in the EHR than assessments of delirium, for example. And so one example of a real world pattern we found is that patients are commonly treated benzodiazepines first, often for several doses, and then switched over to phenobarbital. And from the chart reviews, we hypothesize that patients who receive more benzodiazepines prior to the phenobarbital switch may have worse treatment experiences. And we've done just a basic look using our larger EHR cohort to test this hypothesis. We have um, just shy of 300 patients who were first treated with benzodiazepines and switched over to phenobarbital 
and looking just at the bivariate relationship using logistic regression between um, milligrams of lorazepam equivalents of benzodiazepine prior to phenobarbital as a predictor of restraints as a binary outcome, we see a significant association looking at this graphically, the predicted probability of restraints increases from about 25% to about 35% moving um, from zero to 12 milligram lorazepam equivalents received prior to phenobarbital suggesting an earlier switch to phenobarb may be associated with better outcomes, but we'll of course be doing more involved analyses to try to understand this and other treatment patterns we're seeing, characterize other outcomes like length of stay, confounding variables that need to be considered, treatment effect modifiers, and all of this work is gearing toward our pragmatic, hopefully adaptive trial, which is what I think we really need, randomizing and comparing several variations on treatment for AWS. And I'm going to conclude with an argument that is pitched at the trainees who may be in the audience. And that is pursuing your science is challenging, but just like the uphill journey that is becoming a physician, I think the challenge is really what makes it meaningful. And I feel really lucky to have the freedom to get to work on the teams that I love to work on and pursue these topics that really motivate me. And I would honestly encourage all of you to find and pursue your science and we have lots of room in the alcohol withdrawal space for collaborators. So you can email me and come meet with me. And um, just thank you again to Dr. Ewing, Dr. Lyles, and for the Chair of Medicine Scholars Award, which is a huge help in launching my career. Thanks. I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tessa. Um, and remember, please put your questions in the chat function, and, and Ship and Dari will then be addressing the uh, questions at the end of the all four, at the end of the four talks to the appropriate speaker. And so our final speaker, our fourth speaker, is Dr. Jason Simmons. And uh, Dr. Simmons is an acting assistant professor in the Division of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and also serves as the director of the Hansen's Disease Cl uh, Clinic over at uh, Harborview. And um, he's going to be uh, uh, talking to us today about macrophage fatty acid metabolism and host resistance to mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. So Jason, hey. over to you. Thanks, Conrad, and thanks to Dr. Young as well and the Department of Medicine for this award and the chance to speak to you all today. Um, so yeah, my story starts with um, trying to better define the immune response to TB and then ends with uncovering these metabolic signatures. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to convince you today that those two things are very intricately uh, re uh, related. So brief background is I studied chemistry at Middlebury College during undergraduate years and spent the summers at the University of Utah and had the fortune to work in Ray Jeslin's lab. He was a formative uh, geneticist and um, I learned a lot of molecular biology techniques, but mostly he afforded me a lot of independence at, a, at an early age, that, um, I, which is when I really developed a love for, for lab science. Um, I attended the MSTP program at the University of North Carolina, and there I joined Mike, Mark Heisey's lab. And our interest was studying mosquito transmitted viral infections, um, specifically alpha viruses, and how these antagonize the innate immune response by shutting down interferon signaling. And then I've been at UW since 2012, first for residency and then fellowship. And I had the, the great fortune to join Tom Hahn's lab. And in the Han lab, one of my main research interests is to better define um, a protective immune response, why some individuals seem to restrict or, or don't become infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis despite very high exposure. And one of the attractions to this work is Tom had um, developed these amazing inter international collaborations characterizing these rare human cohorts. So one was in South Africa in collaboration with Bob Wallace and Gavin Churchyard. And then also in Uganda, um, um, Henry Bohm, Kathy Stein, and Harriet Mayanja Kiza at um, Makarere University. And the goal of this work, at least our idea at the outset, was um, if we couldn't identify host targets that could be harnessed for a protective TB response. This was akin to how we have Maraviroc, a, an important HIV therapy that targets a host molecule, CCR5. And we identified this treatment really by better understanding these elite HIV controllers. And we hope to do something similar for, for TB. My clinical um, activities 
as Conrad mentioned, I'm, I'm focused at Harborview, and I, I do have an interest in, in treating mycobacterial infections. And I've been the director of the Hansen's Disease Clinic since 2021. And as part of that work, um, that really led to a different research project. Unfortunately, I don't have the chance to share with you today, but it's to better define why patients with mycobacterium leprae infection have these really dramatic and debilitating inflammatory reactions, even after they've finished antimicrobial treatment. And I'm lucky to be involved in a um, clinical trial in Nepal to better define those responses and then hopefully identify a new therapy. So as, as you all know, mycobacterium infection is transmitted by aerosols, but those early events after infection are very poorly described. And, and that's in part because um, our tools are, are limited. We rely on these immune sensitization tests, the interferon gamma release assay test and the tuberculin skin test. Um, and as you probably know, uh, these tests, if it's negative, it can't really discriminate whether that individual just hasn't been exposed to TB or if they actually had an infection that they cleared very quickly. And then at the same time, a positive test um, just simply reflects immune sensitization. We don't know if there's an ongoing viable infection in these individuals or not. They may have actually cleared that with a protective adaptive immune response. So to study natural resistance to TB, you know, th this is important. And the way we've gotten around this, this problem is to find these, these cohorts of individuals who almost assuredly have been exposed to, to TB. One more household contact in Uganda, um, exposed to usually a household member, uh, family member with active TB. And those contacts were followed for over a decade and they had multiple repeat skin tests and then ultimately interferon gamma release assay testing. And those that remain negative at all testing time points were referred to resistors or RSTR phenotype. Um, the second cohort was quite different. These individuals had high occupational exposure because they'd worked in gold mines for over 15 years. These are known to be absolutely extreme um, transmission settings for, for new TB infections. And they were followed longitudinally over a year. And those with repeated skin and, and interferon gamma release assay testing um, were defined as resistors for our studies. So our, our main hypothesis in focusing on this group um, was whether monocytes and macrophages, which are known early targets for TB in vivo, um, have a, a, a specific or protective response that's not seen in, in controls. And the most obvious evidence of this um, that, that I can share with you is if we differentiate macrophages from monocytes uh, isolated from the Uganda cohort in vitro and infect them with MTB that, that has a luminescent reporter, um, we can see that the resistor macrophages seem to restrict TB growth as compared to latent controls. But the question remains is how, how do they do this? And to get at that, the approach that I have taken is to um, study a, a number of donor cells um, from the, the control latently infected individuals in the resistor cohort and expose them under baseline conditions or MTB stimulated conditions in vitro, isolate RNA, and then do RNA-seq analyses. And we've done a number of, of um, analyses from that data set. Um, a highlight from, from that work um, is shown here. We were interested in shared transcriptional responses um, from the Ugandan resistor cohort is that were shared out with the South African cohort. And there's really four gene sets. These are gene programs um, that were enriched among the resistors in both cohorts. And to, to cut through those details, what these four gene sets are telling us, these are all gene programs that are downstream of a macrophage response to free fatty acids. So we followed up that um, free fatty acid finding with a, a genetic question. We looked at a key lipid metabolism regulator known as AMP kinase. It's essentially a fuel gauge for the cell to devote cellular resources to either generate um, ATP uh, if, if ATP is needed. And we looked at all the genes encoding the subunits of AMP kinase, and we found seven SNPs, um, all encoding one of the subunits, uh, regulatory subunit of AMP kinase, that were strongly associated with resistor phenotype in, in Uganda. Um, we, we were interested in this and we did some follow-up in vitro work where we can activate AMP kinase uh, in vitro and that led to restricted MTB growth um, uh, in a dose-dependent uh, manner. 
So to summarize that work, um, transcriptional networks, as well as these polymorphisms in a central metabolic lipid metabolism regulator really suggests that lipid metabolism is a candidate host resistance pathway. And this was interesting to me because it's it's long been known that if, if you look at a, a, a granuloma in a TB infected patient, uh, what lines the necrotic core of that granuloma are these lipid laden macrophages. And it's it still is accepted and has long been studied that, that TB can acquire host lipids and it may induce this lipid laden phenotype to its own benefit um, because it can acquire lipids from these depots. However, more recently, um, this, this um, lipid laden macrophage phenotype was actually suggested to be a, a host protective uh, phenotype downstream of interferon gamma, which greatly enhances these lipid inclusions and is thought actually to sequester lipids away from uh, the, the ability of TB to use them. And then finally, this is in the backdrop of metabolism itself um, being tightly correlated with downstream immune responses. And so um, our hypothesis and, and the studies I've done since the, the, the early work has been whether we can target lipid metabolism as an, a, a way to enhance TB control within macrophages. And so to, to take you through those studies, it's first important to, to provide a model. So on the left, we have fatty acid synthesis where acetyl-CoA can be metabolized to these long acyl-CoA in, uh, intermediates. Um, and then on the right, you have fatty acid oxidation that utilizes these acyl-CoA intermediates as fuel to import into the, the mitochondria where fatty acid oxidation occurs. Now, um, this there's a key regulatory mechanism that avoids this feudal cycle simultaneously occurring where a key intermediate, which is just downstream of a rate limiting step, malonyl-CoA can negatively regulate fatty acid oxidation by blocking CPT1 activity. Now, was important, I was in, interested in these pathways because I already shared with you the data. If we activate AMP kinase, we restrict TB growth. And AMP kinase is a key regulator of lipid metabolism because it blocks fatty acid synthesis at the rate limiting step acetyl-CoA carboxylase here. In effect, that reduces um, malonyl-CoA and, and re releases this restriction and fatty acid oxidation can occur. And we, we looking back at our transcriptional data set, um, we found that TB actually um, reduces the, the expression of malonyl-CoA decarboxylase. The effect of that would be to increase fatty acid synthesis um, and increase malonyl-CoA levels. Uh, and so we hypothesize that the fatty acid oxidation actually is a host protective pathway. And, and to look further at this, um, we used a small molecule that blocks CPT1 import of, of fatty acids and thereby shutting down fatty acid oxidation. And that led to loss of restriction of, of MTB replication. But these small molecules have, have off target effects. And so my more recent work has been using genetic tools. So CRISPR-Cas9 targeting and, and cell lines to look at individually these key regulators of lipid metabolism. And I only have time to share some data with CPT1. We have an excellent CRISPR knockout pool of, of, of CPT1. And the, um, by knocking that out, that had led to uh, uh, the lack of the ability of these monocytes to control MTB um, infection. Although that, that response has been quite variable in our hands. And so we have some early work focusing more on primary cells that uses siRNA technologies um, to knock down CPT1. And we see a similar effect of, of TB growing more. So we've paralleled that in vitro work um, with um, some early in vivo studies. This is in collaboration with Henry Bohm at Case Western. And in these studies, um, mice were fed various diets, um, um, either a standard chow diet or a diet that's enriched for, for fat, either monounsaturated fat or saturated fat. And one of the striking things is you, you feed these diets uh, with saturated fat, animals gain a tremendous amount of weight. Um, but if you infect the animals with TB, uh, that weight is, is completely restricted. They still gain weight, sort of commensurate with, with the monounsaturated diet, but none of the excess weight um, is gained. And surprisingly, that correlated in vivo with better control for TB as measured by um, CFU in lung and in spleen.
So to summarize um, all of that in vitro and then in vivo data, we've identified lipid metabolism as a candidate host resistance pathway. And we were led there by these resistor studies, both transcriptional networks associated with that phenotype, as well as these genetic um, polymorphisms associated with a phenotype in this lipid regulator. I, I kind of ran quick uh, across data that we have genotype dependent transcriptional um, responses to TB target um, lipid regulators and specifically this malonyl um, CoA decarboxylase. We have similar findings with AMP kinase as well that I didn't have time for. And then finally, at least early studies are suggesting that protection in the TB mouse model correlates with this restriction and in, in, in weight gain. Um, and I hypothesize maybe that has to do with excessive lipid catabolism being protective in vivo. And so the implications are many for this work. Um, the, the main one and the, the long-term one is that TB treatment is, is very long, it's difficult, it's complex, it's toxic, and we need simpler regimens. And, and ideally targeting host factors uh, could, could um, enable simpler treatments. And targeting macrophage lipid metabolism could accomplish this really in, in a couple ways or probably more. Are, are at the outset, we hypothesized we might be able to tune a macrophage to clear TB quicker. And that's known to correlate with macrophages that have a, a hyperinflammatory response and a specific metabolic profile. Um, we were surprised to learn that we're finding a protective phenotype in macrophages that, that metabolize fatty acids. That's in the mouse model, at least, been associated actually with permissive macrophages like alveolar macrophages that are permissive to MTB infection. Infection. But even while being permissive to MTB infection, TB is not stressed in those environments and actually remains more susceptible to antimicrobial treatments. And so I think tuning the macrophage either at, at either end of this, the spectrum could enable more effective antimicrobial therapy. So I have too many people to thank in such a short time. Definitely the, the Department of Medicine um, for this award. Um, I've mentioned some key collaborators, uh, both in, in South Africa at the Orem Institute and in Case Western and Makarere University um, funding sources, and then um, past and present members of the, the Han Lab. In particular, Tom has really been a, a, a champion. Um, this uh, I, I didn't go looking to study metabolism and it's led to uh, many uh, uncertainties along the way. And he's always had uh, quite a bit of faith in, in me and my work and I appreciate him for that. And I will stop and take questions. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. And congratulations to each of our four uh, Chair of Medicine Scholar Award recipients this year. Um, you saw a nice spectrum of research being uh, performed in the Department of Medicine. And um, like I said, uh, we'll now take uh, questions that have been submitted via the chat, and I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Dr. Bandari to address the questions to the appropriate speaker. Thank you to all the, uh, a big thank you to all of the speakers for your wonderful presentations. We have a few questions in the chat, which I'll, I'll read out now. The first is um, from Dr. James Town um, to Dr. Tessa Steele. Um, the question reads as uh, regarding restraints as an outcome, they're often used disproportionately in patients of color or low English proficiency or in areas that are understaffed. How will you account for this and whatever the baseline culture of restraint use is in our ICUs? I think that's a very great point. And also, um, you know, we're, we're looking at patients in the hospital in general and patients in the intensive care unit are, are more likely to be put in restraints for various reasons as well. So I think we're going to have to do quite a lot of stratified analyses to see how this outcome is looking and how it varies in different subsets of the population um, to really evaluate its strengths, potential strengths and its weaknesses. I think we have time. We're almost at the end of the hour, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions at most here. So sorry about those limitations. That's just what happens when you have four speakers, but um, there are four very nice talks. So Shiv, another question? Yes, thank you, Dr. Steele, for that response. And our next question is also for um, uh, for Dr. Steele from Dr. Neha Sate. Um, has obtaining informed consent in patients with alcohol, acute alcohol withdrawal, either related to delirium or cognitive impairment or poor outreach, been a barrier to research in this population? And how have you addressed this in your work? Yeah, I think that anyone who kind of is involved in 
um, trying to enroll patients in, in clinical studies understands that there are barriers to minoritized groups participating, people that do not you know, speak English, as well as people that have altered mental status. And so this is a challenge that we've characterized in the chart reviews, for example, a large proportion of patients are not in the first 24 hours able to, to consent for research, and many don't have um, contacts to consent for them. And so um, this is a challenge that we're going to have to look into. But what we're trying to argue is that there's equipoise, actually, and that that existing treatments are so variable that we may be able to to randomize with that with waiving consent um, for very for these various first line treatments. So Shiv, we're at the uh, end of the hour here, but why don't you uh, read the um, comment that was in the chat from Dr. Carew? Yes, um, from Dr. Carew, kudos to all of the presenters and to the Department of Medicine for supporting the truly inspiring work by these scholars. Thank you so, so much for your wonderful presentations that were very engaging and diverse in content, and I think definitely made me think and stretch my mind. So appreciate, appreciate your work. Thank you, everyone, for attending these, and congratulations to the four Chair of Medicine Scholar Award winners. Thank you.